Greetings, everybody. This is uh, Professor Hussain here with <coughs> Aviation Law and Regulations, AVM, AVM 2320 uh, course. Welcome, first class, first lecture. We, <coughs> I will be holding these classes every week on a Tuesday uh, at uh, 12 p.m. So uh, I'm a little off today, but uh, this is chapter one. Uh, we'll be going over over international regulations and regulatory issues in aviation. And then we'll go subsequently to chapter one again, and then chapter two, three, and four this week. So a lot of, a lot of readings to do. But make sure you keep up with uh, with the lectures as well as uh, the notes and and these powerpoints, which are in a week uh, weekly folders, and you can review them as well. Overview: What are the business models used by airlines today? What is the regulatory international framework governing airlines? What is the relevance, uh, relevance of regulatory framework for emerging business models? So we'll be looking at different uh, different business models, which with regards to <coughs> uh, regulations, how international regulations play its role, and how we should be framing uh, rules and regulations based on um, the business models that we uh, or or the airlines are applying to. We also talk about <coughs> hub and spoke airlines, point to point airlines, and as we know, that's the and that's the go to business model, which is hub and spoke. So we'll cover that as well. This one just shows you <coughs> how with two flights. Uh, just just an example here uh, from uh, Miami to Bermuda, and then Miami to <coughs> Caracas, uh, Venezuela, and then Bogota in uh, in Colombia, and then as well as uh, domestic flight, which is Miami to to uh, what do you call it? New Orleans. Combining passengers from different origin cities to a common destination increases revenue requires an aircraft to stop at a hub instead of going non-stop as a crow flies only increases cost relatively modestly uh, more fuel more ground crews in reality instead of one aircraft flying through the hub use of optimal mix of small and large aircrafts transforming passengers at transferring passengers at the hub so that means uh, passengers going into miami and then we are redistributing them to their final destination. That's one one way of uh, uh, one business model. <coughs> point to point is focus only on the market that is sufficient demand relative to aircraft capacity. Simplified uh, fleet, one type of aircraft, less training, eases maintenance. Uh, a good example would be JetBlue uh, flying into, let's say, Orlando with point-to-point uh, -point, uh, flights. That means direct flights from, let's say, Westchester County in New York or Boston or JFK directly to MCO. And they have simplified uh, one type of aircraft, Airbus 320, and they're also using 19 and 21. Uh, <coughs> not much difference between these aircrafts except for the, the passenger capacity. Uh, there's no frills, no services, an extreme focus on cost control, and with even lower tickets, unit price should not exceed unit costs. <clears throat> when we look at international uh, uh, traffic aggravation power of hub and spoke is well suited for international service. Low cost point to point unit lines have not yet demonstrated ability to serve international markets. Good example would be uh, Emirates Airlines and Qatar Airways. 
MS flying from Dubai, Qatar, from Doha. So although they have all types of aircrafts, they have <clears throat> full range of connections from these hubs, and they are called mega hubs or super hubs uh, internationally. <clears throat> Uh, product uh, obviously becomes uh, complex because of uh, different types of aircrafts. But I have spoke networks have greater challenges to overcome in rigid international regulatory environment. That means it it, it makes it complicated because uh, they're dealing with uh, different complex international markets, <coughs> especially especially Emirates airline. Uh, you know, uh, operating out of uh, all continents. There's North America, South America, Central, <coughs> Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia, New Zealand. Unlike international freedom of seas, there's no general freedom of air. Chicago Convention in 1994 established framework for economic regulation of international aviation also created in ICAO to address technical issues safety as well as navigation <coughs> multiple multilateral approaches to air transportation favored by US was rejected in favor of bilateral approaches favored by Europeans the Bermuda conference of 1946 produced bilateral agreements between US, UK and served as a model for many agreements to come. Looking at the content of uh, bilateral agreements, uh, patch quilt of bilateral agreements restricts number of carriers that can serve a particular market. Capacity and restrictions <coughs> limited limited uh, routes, pricing, limits on foreign ownership and control, cabotage, nationality clauses. Uh, <coughs> U.S. bilateral agreements are executive agreements, not treaties. Looking at, uh, looking at the content of uh, bilateral agreements, frame is created <coughs> for quasi-judicial proceeding between carriers competing for traffic rights and opportunities. 
administered by initially by Civil Aviation Board, now by U.S. Department of Transportation, <laughs> resulted in insurance of certificate of public convenience and necessity authorizing services on a specific route. Emergence of national fair carriers to exercise bilateral obtained rights. So <clears throat> obviously, way back then, there used to be a lot more emphasis on flag carriers, which is, you know, uh, a national carrier. Uh, in the U.S., we had Pan Am, which was representing America. And obviously, worldwide, more people knew about Pan Am than American, Eastern, or, or Delta. U.S. Uh, regulatory initiative, buoyed by uh, deregulation of domestic airline industry, 70, 1978, U.S. started pressing for less restrictive, more flexible international bilateral agreement. U.S. has since signed 60 open skies agreement worldwide. <coughs> U.S.-EU breakthrough agreements signed in 2007. The traffic and nationality restriction, but even open skies agreements are not truly open. Two levels of economic regulatory embedded in all bilateral agreements. Freedom of air, <coughs> dating back to the Chicago Convention of 1944, defines what specific markets can be saved, served. Nationality clause only permits airlines substantially owned and effectively controlled by a country in question and its nationals to exercise traffic rights <clears throat> so let's look at uh, traffic rights overflying or going into or going from uh, one nation to the other and it's called freedom of <clears throat> freedoms of the air first freedom is uh, the right to fly over another country without landing <clears throat> that's first freedom Second freedom is the right to make a technical landing without picking up or letting off revenue traffic. That means flying from A to C and stopping over B. <clears throat> then we got third freedom, which is the right to carry revenue traffic from eight from <coughs> nation A to nation B. And then we have fourth freedom, right to carry revenue traffic from B to A. That is, <clears throat> first one is carrying passengers from US to Canada. And then <clears throat> for us, fourth freedom will be bringing passengers from Canada to, to the United States. Fifth freedom will be the right to pick up or let off revenue traffic between two foreign nations. That means going to <coughs> nation D, that is, for example, we are flying from US uh, over to, let's say, South America, start stopping over in, in, for example, in Jamaica, then going over to Venezuela, and then uh, flight ending in Colombia, and then going back tracking <coughs> the same way in D, C, D, and A, that is, uh, in our case, Colombia, Venezuela, Jamaica, and, and the U.S. <laughs> Sixth freedom is the right to carry traffic between B and C via homeland of the airline, airline A, nation A, not recognized by Chicago <coughs> Convention. Then we got Seventh, right to carry moving wholly between B and C, not from or via homeland of airline A is not recognized by convention. That means we can't, Emirates Airline cannot pick up passengers from US and take them to United Kingdom. Uh, it has to be uh, the only country. That means from UAE, from Emirates to US and US to Emirates. <coughs> Then we got eighth freedom <clears throat> is capitalized, is right to pick up or let off revenue traffic between points within nation that is not homeland of, it, <coughs> of the air and not recognized in the Chicago Convention. That means 
if a British Airways flies in from London to New York and they can pick up passengers from New York to, let's say, Chicago, and on the way back, <clears throat> fly from Chicago to New York and then go back to and back to London. Uh, these are two different agreements between two nations. Relevance of bilateral agreements to hub and structure. Recall the need to combine passengers from different origin points traveling to a common destination, some traveling from a spoke to hub and some originating from a hub going to a spoke. Others going to one spoke to another spoke through the hub. Then we have uh, looking into bilateral agreements, hub structure, when spoke cities and hubs are located in different cities, countries, complexity quickly arises. A given plane load of passengers often governed by mirrors of bilateral agreements with passengers authorized by different freedoms of air. <clears throat> For example, American airline flying from Miami to Buenos Aires in Argentina, then onward to Montevideo, Uruguay, uh, their passengers in the following category originating in US bound for, for Brown for Argentina, that's third freedom, that's bilateral agreement between US and, and uh, Argentina. Then <clears throat> originating in US bound for Uruguay, this is third freedom on this US or Uruguay agreement, that is Miami to Buenos Aires and Buenos Aires to Montevideo. And then we have Spain, Miami, Buenos Aires, Montevideo. That's another one, which is going to Miami, onwards to Buenos Aires, and then Montevideo. <clears throat> then we have bilateral agreements, hub and structure, originating in Buenos Aires and outbound for Uruguay, which is fifth freedom in the U.S. agreement, <coughs> and the U.S. Uruguay agreements. Then we have if traffic rights are not available, or available in suboptimal minimum <coughs> hub type economic levels, not enough seats available, not enough market to feed sufficient passengers, insufficient use of aircraft. So obviously we're looking at supply and demand in this case. Strategies for copying regulatory and Coping with restri uh, regulatory restriction. Imagine <coughs> power or double hub structures to serve exponentially greater number of city pairs. That is, uh, US spoke cities almost to Chicago, Canadian spoke cities to Chicago, and other spoke cities to Chicago. And then fly over to London, and then obviously from there going to spoke cities in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Foreign ownership and control, if U.S. does not have sufficient traffic rights beyond London, why not buy a U.S. U.K. airline or vis-a-vis? 25% uh, voting equity rights limits the foreign ownership of U.S. airline and 49% non-voting equity interest permitted if de facto foreign control. Similarly, 49% ownership restrictions in Europe. All it means is <clears throat> most nations restrict ownership of their domestic areas uh, to protect their domestic market as well. If U.S. cannot buy a fly beyond London spoke uh, to spokes in foreign countries, why not at least gather passengers by flying aircraft to points within the U.K. Uh, in the U.S., foreign carry airlines may not carry passengers between points within the U.S. So that means, uh, just like in the U.S., there's a restriction on foreign carriers doing domestic market. Same way, you, EU has restrictions on the U.S. carriers going into uh, <coughs> going into European markets, and this is when code sharing comes in. International seeks airlines seek net network breadth and depth through code sharing to garner free traffic, joint ventures, 
through mergers, alliances, locally controlled subsidiaries. <clears throat> Holding out of a transportation facility using a flight a designated code, A American Airlines and BA, which is British, <coughs> to simulate online connections. Code sharing is form of subcontracting by marketing carriers to operating carriers. Regulatory requires marketing carriers to hold traffic rights under bilateral agreements. <clears throat> and we have uh, by multilateral alliances, which is One World, Star, Sky, Team alliances. Multi-alliance combination of code sharing, frequent flyers, <coughs> reward park, program, and reciprocity, and harmonization of other customer services. And then we have uh, antitrust immunity as well. <laughs> to increase economics or economies of scale and scope, maximum traffic rights, airlines are created revenue generating as substitute for <laughs> True mergers. Excuse me. U.S. Department of Transportation has power under to grant antitrust immunity. It bestows ability to act as single enterprise, collaborating on marketing activities and sharing revenues and profit. Star Alliance has granted broad bilateral immunity. Sky Team carriers have reapplied for similar multilateral immunity. One World Alliance historically limited to closed skies. <clears throat> EU development, EU and US are moving away from freedom of air and statutory limitation on foreign ownership and control. This follows the European Court Justice, <clears throat> Court Justice decision declaring nationality clause in US bilateral agreements with European countries unlawful. While it's European right of establishment, that is, Greek carrier must have the right to set up a shop and exercise traffic rights from France. After nearly five, year, five years of negotiation, US and EU agreed to first stage Open Skies Agreement in 2007. The agreement will take effect in March 2008, the term of agreement, EU carriers will <coughs> able to operate from any city in the US, EU to any city in, in the US. Most important is uh, in the opening of Heathrow Airport towards uh, today only American, United, British and Virgin Atlantic are permitted to operate U.S. U.S. Heathrow markets. U.S. will launch new services to Heathrow, Delta, Continental, Northwest, <coughs> and U.S. Airways. Incumbent will shift Gatwick services to in Heathrow to respond to increased competition. Does not provide new landing and takeoff slots at Heathrow. Carriers must find their own slots and facilities in order to operate Heathrow. Else. Lucrative gray market has developed. Carriers rely on the US UK High Court decision in Guernsey case to legitimize multi million dollar slot swaps. <clears throat> then that increases uh, continental Europe will increase in competition as well. Virgin Atlantic has plans to launch new services from France, <coughs> Paris, Frankfurt. Milan, Zurich, initially to New York and later to other U.S. destinations. British Airways has plans to launch a series of new services from continental Europe to U.S. in the summer of 2008. The relaxation of bilateral constraints in U.S., <coughs> U.K., Spain, and Ireland and other uh, European countries will facilitate antitrust immunized alliances. <coughs> Point-to-point -point international services, emergence of MaxJet, EOS, Silverjet in US, London market, 
operating for secondary airport that stands dead <clears throat> and less connecting passengers and health premium products focus on locally originating business travelers and also looking at uh, low-cost carriers Ryanair is considering services from <clears throat> Dublin and Frankfurt to US points <coughs> Point to point services. This one just shows you international services of EOS, cabin configuration. Maxjet uh, cabin configuration for uh, Maxjet. <clears throat> Second stage negotiation was completed about 2010 to address more controversial issues, including further liberalization of traffic and <coughs> additional foreign investment opportunities and control of. U.S. carriers. We'll continue by driven by two important principles. Hub will continue to be vulnerable traffic aggregators. Network ambiguity is important to customers. Code sharing brand alliances enhances network and provides transition strategies. And gross border, cross border MA and help with international airlines find optimal scope and scale. Point to point niche markets may get stronger. <clears throat> this is it for chapter one. I shall continue with chapter two uh, momentarily. Thank you and have a great day.